Hey there, Wargamers, Justin here on Painting Today. I want to talk to you guys a little bit about tactics and strategy in Alpha Strike. I'd like to welcome you guys back to the channel. If you are new here, please, Alpha Strike, that like and subscribe button. If you're a returning viewer, thank you for having my back. I appreciate you having my six. Thank you for being an awesome lance mate, star mate, whatever the case may be for you. Appreciate you being here to help support what I do. That said, let's jump right into today's topic. I want to preface things today by saying uh, this video is just mostly going to be me sitting here rambling so you can minimize it and have it in the background, work on some hobby stuff, maybe some list building, things of that nature. Um, maybe a little bit more like a podcast format. I'm not sure how long this video will last, but I wanted to put something out uh, that addressed a few topics that I was thinking of while on my drives to work and while I've been contemplating what I want to do at Southern Assault. Now, in this particular video, some of you guys may be prepping for Southern Assault, so you're getting your list going, your list building, trying to figure out what it is that you want to do. Some of you may be new to Alpha Strike, and these uh, gameplay philosophies, ideas, strategies, things like that will apply for you as well. Or you may be a veteran player who's not getting ready for a tournament, but you are just curious about my thoughts, my perspectives on how I approach um, games in general, but also Alpha Strike and um, some of the concepts that go through my brain. Now, some of these may be obvious for all of you, some may not. So when I approach um, Alpha Strike and generally any kind of war game, there are a few topics that come to mind in my head, uh, four in particular, that range from uh, overall strategy from I'm going to play, list building, and what exactly I want my opponent to do or think I'm going to do, and then how I'm going to try and win the game in terms of using my list and uh, how I want to employ some of the, the strategies that I'm going to talk about today. Um, now that all sounds kind of basic and dumb, but uh, as we get into this, hopefully some of that will make sense. So uh, first and foremost, the four kind of things that go through my mind when it comes to list building is technology, attrition, uh, castling, and alpha strike. Not the game alpha strike, but the concept of alpha strike. So uh, let's take for a moment um, technology. Uh, this is a little bit of a term that I picked up from Wargamer Fritz. Back in the day when he used to be known as Boy of Sam Han, um, I guess he's, is it working with Fritz now? I guess at one point he was Fritz 40K. He talked about this a lot and the term makes sense. Um, and basically what technology is, is where you're doing a thing hoping to make your opponent respond in a certain way. Uh, so one of the things that is going to come up, and you'll see this very frequently in games of Alpha Strike, someone playing a clan list in particular, you're going to see like a Fire Moth um, or a really fast mech that's Omni and carrying battle armor. Um, so what does that do? You know when you see that, that particular me uh, mech, especially if it's a fast one, is probably trying to drive down the field, deploy the battle armor behind you or in base-to-base -base contact with you so it can hit a devastating like melee strike, a rear strike, and while the um, uh, mech in question wants to shoot you in the rear as well. So by play where you place that mech, you know it's going to cause your opponent to respond. Either they're going to run from it, they're going to deploy, a uh, deploy away from it, or they're going to overload to deploy to try and combat it. And because you know how your opponent's gonna to respond to that or how they might respond or, or what you expect them to do allows you to change your strategy for the game. So if you were to put, um, I got a little model here, I'm just grabbing, you guys probably can't see it, but if I was to put this model down on a flank and it's got a battle armor riding on it and my opponent goes, oh shit, I don't wanna deal with that and they overload on the other side, now that gives this guy free reign to run down the table, try and flank, come behind, because all the guns have shifted, and this guy's fast enough that I can take some sprint maneuvers and try and get him some, in, into position. It also allows me to push objectives. If they've abandoned those in favor of fighting my main force, these little guy can run up and hold an objective. Um, if my opponent overloads because they want to fight it because they think it's going to be a weak link, this is fast enough to run and regroup with the force on the other side. So you're forcing your opponent to choose how they want to respond to the sky, and that dictates how you are going to respond in kind. And if you have an overall gameplay or strategy in mind, when you do that, you may put it off to the side knowing that I don't care what they do over there. I just want to see how they're going to respond. I'm going to regroup my main force anyway. I want this guy to actually deploy the battle armor. I'm not trying to run up there and hold objectives. I have other units for that. So you get to kind of trick them into what um, you might want them to do. Uh, sometimes, um, I've had this come up during a game, though that's more deployment. I uh, had this happen last year at Southern Assault. It was a younger guy, so he, he didn't expect this, but uh, every turn or every, every round in Alpha Strike and Classic in general, if you win initiative, uh, you go second. You always get the last move, right? So when I was playing this particular game, I always saved my, uh, my light mech almost exclusively for last. I want my Fire Moth or the equivalent with the Battle Armor to go last so that I can get the best positioning possible so that I can drop my, my Battle Armor if possible or so I can get the heck out of there if, if I see too many guns and I don't want to weather that storm. So multiple turns in a row I do this every turn. He sees me go, I'm making him you know position considering where that, that Light Mech's going to go. And then he plans for it and my second to last activation I move the Light Mech and he goes, 
well, you didn't, you didn't leave it for last. Why not? And I was like, I knew you were planning for it. I got a different strategy now. Um, and he, it threw off his whole turn because he didn't, he expected me to do that over and over. So like, you're playing into that, that threat, them knowing like, oh, he's going to do this with this guy. And then you see them plan for it and you get to kind of pull the rug out from under them and do something else. So that's kind of what I mean with technology. And you can do that with other examples too, not just the, the mech with the, the battle armor. You can have a particularly lethal uh, miniature, uh, a unit, maybe it's a, a transport with infantry in it, uh, flamers, uh, maybe it's a particularly fast and vicious like melee mech or something like with a really good like threat bubble. It forces them to play around it and they may be afraid. Even if you're like, hey, this guy's only got a whatever gunner, gunnery skill, I'm having a hard time hitting. But the, the thought process of that mech actually connecting and hurting may make them play a certain way. So that's what I mean with technology. Um, and that, that comes to play into play with how you might deploy your forces and what you're doing, your overall strategy throughout the game. Think about what your opponent's thinking about uh, and how they might respond to where you put a threat to them uh, and try and play into that. Especially if you notice them really positioned away from a miniature um, that they're afraid of or a particular unit, um, you can use that to your advantage to get them to maneuver around the table kind of where you might want them to be. Now, the other terms that I have talked about or I mentioned uh, was Alpha Strike, Attrition, and Castling. So, um, we're going to leave uh, Alpha Strike for last. Um, we're going to talk about Attrition and Castling. So, uh, those are two different things that can play similar. So, when I mention Attrition, uh, and I'm, if I'm playing an Attrition-based game, that generally means I'm trying to weather a storm. I am trying to have more material than you do. I'm trying to lose less than you and, and cause you to take more casualties, right? Um, that generally, for me, ends up meaning that I'm bringing more models, so it's a quantity versus quality equation, uh, and against lists that have low model counts, so let's say I bring, it's a very extreme example, let's say I bring a company of mechs, 12 models, and they're all average or, um, or you know, less below average, but I have 12 minis to maneuver, and my opponent brings five, they bring a star. That's a very extreme example, but for this case, let's say that's what they do. Um, they've got five really elite guys that can hit, but their defense has not gone up. Their point cost is only um, attributed to their combat effectiveness, right, uh, in terms of damage. So a 30-point um, Mad Dog versus a 60-point Mad Dog, if they do the same damage, the 60-point one is going to hit more consistently, but they both die just as easy, right? Because their defense didn't go up, their combat effectiveness in terms of um, offense has gone up. Um, so by you having more miniatures to maneuver, um, you have more guns to fire at them. When you lose a model, attrition, it doesn't hurt you as bad, and you have more material to play the objective game. So when you're approaching your list building and your overall strategy for a game, considering how you want to play is important. I find for me, an attrition-based game means I have more models to play with, I have more dice and potential to roll against you. Even if I have a hard time hitting, I have more potential to do things, and if I lose a model, it's not nearly as devastating. Uh, sure, the trade-off is the, the opponent's models, if they're playing a more elite list, are going to hit more consistently. They can't spread themselves out. They have to castle, which will or more likely, uh, which we'll get to in a moment. And if they lose a mini, it hurts more because they cost so much. So if I'm able to trade two 15-point models, right, in a firefight exchange, but my totality of my force is able to take out a 60-point model, that's a good trade. I've lost uh, more activations, but I've taken out 20% of their force. And depending on which model it was, it might be more in terms of combat effectiveness from their overall force. So um, I like to play an attrition-based game. I do not like to play a very elite small model count force in Alpha Strike 40K. If you play Warhammer, it's a different story because you have different ways to manipulate the game uh, to your favor. In Alpha Strike, in general, I like to have a lot of models. Uh, so what do I mean by castling? So castling is where you kind of have like all of your models together, your force uh, overlapping fields of fire and they're really close together. You don't have outriders or outlier units that are off on their own independent. Um, now sometimes you may, uh, you may, your force may break off and do things to intercept, but in general your castling uh, term is referring to a force that's really close together, protecting itself and making itself kind of like, think of like a, a turtle with spikes on it and the only way you could fight it is to punch it, right? Well, it's got spikes, I don't want to punch it. <laughs> when you're looking at a castled up list, it's the same thing. It's, the, it's a big castle, uh, it's got arrows, it's got the little spike pits and so forth in it, and it's like, do I want to break against that wall? Maybe not. It's intimidating, and, and you're, you've got all that force there. So when your opponent's fighting it, if you're playing, let's say, an elite force, you got those, let's say those five clan mechs again, and they're going up against a castle list, or, or it doesn't necessarily have to be a castle list, a, a group that is currently castling, that one model going in for a shot on something isn't worth it if they, by making one shot, they open themselves up to a whole force shooting, right? So that's where positioning uh, comes into play. So um, if I'm playing like an attrition-based force, I may also castle and bring everything together because the opponent who's playing the elite force, 
my guns are more effective if more of them can shoot at my opponent. Um, and your opponent can combat that some by uh, having more of their forces come around, their elite forces, but they only have so many. So if they want to fight the castle or the big primary group, they have to abandon objectives, right? Now, if you have a castle and you break off a little outrider unit that's able to fight in, or, or move independently, maybe it has a light mech that can go harass, it can drop it, its battle armor, the technology, the things to get them to maneuver where you want them to be, or maybe they're pushing objectives, they have to make a choice. Do I fight the castle? That's um, the big, easier thing. Do I go after this thing that I'm going to chase? What do I do? If they take the bait and go after the castle, it's a lot harder for them to take out because its, it's, it's strength is kind of in it being all integrated. Uh, and it allows your other mechs that are going to break off from the main force to push objectives. Um, and if they don't collapse onto the castle, uh, you let them go after objectives, you try and tie up the game as best as possible, then you use your castle to leverage damage on the units you can see. Shoot stuff, kill it till it's dead. Um, now that's a super basic overview of what I mean by castling, uh, but the theory is there. And one of the things that I think is probably worth um, honing in on here is every time I've talked about a topic that goes through my head, despite talking fast, I'm probably talking really fast, um, but the, the, the thread that connects them all is like, the terms mean something, but the strategies are not necessarily interchangeable, but they're interwoven. So I talk about castling and what it is in its core, then I immediately start talking about, actually, you could break off and do this thing. Here's this thing that you would do if you were um, I'm trying to alpha strike something, you're trying to push an objective. So like, you can build a list to be a certain way, um, but the way you play it during a game may shift based on what's, what your opponent's doing, what's on the table, and I think it's important to consider uh, what's going on. Uh, now, the term alpha strike, uh, what do I mean with that? Um, so that probably seems very obvious, but generally when I say alpha strike, I mean maximum amount of damage, extreme tabletop wargaming, dice rolling, violence as quickly as possible. Um, this type of philosophy generally is probably going to be a little bit opposite of attrition. Um, I'll give you a very extreme example from Southern Assault 2022. Uh, the last year's winner, I think, was Carrie Jo. Um, I played against her list, and... I gave, I gave it a pretty good run for its money. Um, had dice rolls went better on uh, the first turn or two, I might have had a fighting chance, and that's just the way it is when you, you, you throw things on the table and you let the dice roll, and it is what it is. Um, she threw a lot of models on objectives. I threw a lot of models on objectives. I play attrition-based game. You have to take me off objectives. The trade-off was I could put enough material on the objectives that she would have to clear some to be able to take them from me, and she was able to do so because her list was built to be uh, an Alpha Strike style list, and the dice went slightly in her favor. Um, I lost models, and I couldn't um, return the shots, right? So her list was built a bit more on the Alpha Strike side, and what she had was a vehicle carrying the Tortoise, I think it's Tortoise 2 battle armor, um, inside it as a carry capacity, and on the outside she had a battle armor riding on it. So she would drive forward with the vehicle, dump out the tortoise battle armor, disembark the battle armor riding outside, and all of a sudden you have a vehicle and you have two battle armor in your face. Three units holding an objective, so you've, you've got the forward projection, right? And then they do massive amounts of damage. So with her list, what she wanted to do, uh, at least this is the way I interpret it, at least in our game, um, she threw those uh, the vehicle and two battle armor on objectives. She throws them on there. She knows that I have to clear them. If I want to get points, i got to kill those units. That means I have to fight those units. Those units are designed early on as an attrition-based thing. Think of that, because we're interweaving things. They're designed to do maximum damage, extreme tabletop wargaming violence uh, as quickly as possible on the first turn or two. And what she's wanting to do is to remove material from your army quickly before you can score so that she is trading material in a positive direction to where it's much easier for her once the Alpha Strike has happened to sit back and hold objectives if she needs to. And if you have to waste a bunch of material fighting those battle armor, um, what have you, you haven't spent that, the, that same, the, those shots aren't going into mechs. Uh, so the battle armor may be easy to kill and you need to clear it because it does a lot of damage. If you ignore it, it's gonna tear you up. And if you fail to clear it, it may trade with you and trade in a positive direction for her. So she threw these guys on objectives. That was three units on two objectives I needed to clear. Um, that's a lot of material. They do a lot of damage and then you're, you're exchanging fire and trading. So she was able to trade material early and get ahead on the material game. I was unable to clear her off an objective. She was able to get ahead on the points. Now I'm fighting off my back foot. I have less models to fight with early on, and I have less models to hold objectives with early on. Um, so that is the gamble uh, with an Alpha Strike list. Had that went the opposite direction and some dice rolls went more in my favor and not hers, those models that are on there, the Alpha Strike's done. If it doesn't kill anything, you, you clear them, and now you've lost material. So it ends up being almost like gambling to a degree. You're playing the odds when you got your hand. Technology might be like bluffing, 
but you're saying, hey, what, what are the odds of me winning with this hand? Okay, I have to play this hand, I have a 65% chance to win. In this case, let's say 66, because two out of three, right? You play the hand, there's still a one in three chance your opponent's got the counter, or they got the better hand, right? But you still play the odds, and six out of um, 10 games, um, you know, ish, almost set, seven out of 10 games rounded up, um, this works, and that's the odds. Statistically, you do this because more often than not, it works. And my game with Carrie Joe, I played the odds thinking, okay, this I think is the best chance I have at winning. If I sit back and I don't push those objectives and she's got that alpha strike style list, I've given her momentum, she's got the points. And if she didn't clear material, she's got the points. So me as the, the defending player here, or in my case, just me, um, I have to fight this. I have to walk into it or I give the game up. And that comes into like the technology. And one of the things she said to me when we were playing, um, she said, wow, you're shooting at my battle armor and it came as like a surprise. I'm like, yes, they do a lot of damage. I have to take them off the table. If I don't, and you've got these like five damage output battle armor, whatever they were, like they're gonna shoot me every turn. They're holding objective, they do a lot of damage. I have to clear them. And so I knew, like I knew what I needed to do to deal with them, but it was a struggle. Ultimately it didn't work, but it's a really, really good game. Um, so her list, I would say, is a bit more on the Alpha Strike side. Her first and foremost goal is to come forward with extreme violence with those battle armor, do as much damage as possible, hopefully enough damage and material trading uh, such that she can get ahead on objectives. And now the onus is on her opponent to be you know, trying to play to win. That is generally how I like to play. Um, and this is where we're gonna kinda, uh, kinda, kinda bring things full circle. How can I play an Alpha Strike style uh, philosophy if I like to play attrition games. Carrie Joe's list plays that way. Um, so this is where the bring it all together I think makes sense. Think about how you want your list to be built and then what you want it to do and what each element does. So in her list, she knew I have a bunch of models, I have mobility, I can bring everything in to condense to castle. I can also project my force because I have jump jets and I have speed and my, I have enough material um, that my models can get out there and hold objectives. And then I have this element, this element, this element that do maximum damage. So if I need to trade early and take out someone's key piece or a secured objective, I can. These other units in the back don't hit as hard, um, but these up here are meant to do, to do that. So early on, you got your alpha strike element, you've got um, bases covered in terms of having enough models to move. So attrition, you got enough models to play the game. You can move things back to castle to defend your own units. Um, and then you've got the trick knowledge on making players play around it. So it's a really well-rounded list and that's a way to bring all those philosophies kind of together. So when you guys are trying to take this uh, philosophy and uh, determine how you want to build your list, consider how you want to play. Do you want to play low model count, uh, really elite pilots? Um, and struggle uh, in terms of playing the objectives? Or do you wanna play something that has a lot of models and can't do a lot of damage, but you can play the objective game and your opponent has to ch you know, you know, chew through your miniatures? Those are on polar opposites. I think somewhere in the middle is where you wanna be. Quality versus quantity equation, find that happy medium. And when you're building your list, think about how many models do you wanna have on the table to play the objective? What do they do? And do I have an alpha strike element? So for me, I generally like to put 10 to 12 models on the table if I'm playing around, um, uh, I guess Bobby's event is 375. And at that point total and last year's point total, um, I was aiming to have between 10 and 12 miniatures. I forget what the cap was that he had, but I like to have a lot of material. Uh, I generally don't like to lean into the eight. Um, so last year I might've had eight and two battle armor because um, I think it was two lances. Um, I feel like I'm starting to get too lean. Definitely not gonna play one star. If I was playing 375 points and I ran a star and like five battle armor, it's 10 activations, sort of, 10 units, but five big ones and the dudes are riding on your, your mechs. It's still really like five guys to be pushing objectives and playing in a game that might have up to six objectives that can't hold everything. Um, then you're gonna be making points up by, by having really low pilot skills, which is good. They can hit, but you can't win a chess game with, with five pieces. I mean, you, you could. But you know, hear me out, if you're playing a chess game with someone who's of equal caliber and you only have five pieces and they have their whole army, it's gonna be a lot more difficult, right? And then every time you lose one, it becomes harder and harder, right? Um, I don't know if that, that, that analogy makes sense, but that's where my brain goes. So I will build a list. Um, let's say, let's go with uh, Southern Salt 2021. I think that was my more, um, the stronger of my lists. And for that list, I had, um, I think, 12 models. I uh, would have had 15 um, if Bobby would have allowed me to play um, duplicates of battle armor. Um, that wasn't because I was trying to be cheesy because I didn't actually know about good battle armor back then, um, but I was trying to bring a full trinary, so two stars and then five points of elementals for 15 minis. Uh, but I ended up having um, 12 minis, so 10 uh, mechs and two battle armor. 
and I had um, enough models to push onto objectives, add enough speed for the guys in the front to get high TMM and get on objectives. I had um, average units in the back that dealt damage, my heavies that were a little bit slower. Uh, and then I had a couple of my lights with really high TMM and jump and carrying battle armor. So you jump forward on an objective, you have a high TMM, they, have to, they either have to shoot that unit um, to clear you, or you're gonna maybe get ahead on the objective points, and any shots they're putting into this high TMM unit and failing or shots not going into your other units, and it's a gamble. Uh, so if I throw this, I think it was a pack hunter or something I had with like plus four TMM, it was nuts. Um, it was a gamble, they spike it and they hit it and they kill the guy. But that's where we're going. Okay, I have a 66% or 67% chance, 70% chance this turn, I have a 30% chance of failing, 70% chance of succeeding. If I succeed and that unit doesn't die, I get a point, I'm ahead, and being ahead is important. Uh, so my list had that. I had a unit that could project forward like, like the, the pack hunter uh, carrying a battle armor, so I drive forward, I dump it behind you, I try and do damage, so technology, I'm forcing opponents to move around. Enough material to, material to throw everything up on objectives, which I did some castling with that, so I'd throw a lot of material on objectives. You would watch me um, in this tournament, I'd have um, like I said, there's three objectives, and I throw my whole army on like two of them, right? Because if I can, if I can secure two of them, I get ahead by a point early on, and then now you have to get, at some point get ahead of me, and I've got more material if we've traded. So uh, I would castle all my dudes depending on where they were. I would have um, attrition to my favorite because I have more models, um, and then by, because I have more models, I was able to um, bring more guns to bear on my opponent's stuff. Um, one point during, I think it was 2023, Dave Alsiger asked me, he's like, you're gonna have to tell me about this Operation Congo line because at one point my opponent. I had a juicy target out there and I had a mech come up and mech come up and they were they were funneling in line like they were coming around a corner to shoot everything um, and they all shot the one target and then because I positioned that way uh, my opponent had a model that I was able to single out with like five of my mechs um, and my five mechs weren't visible to the majority of her other forces right um, so I threw all those guns on that one and took it out uh, and that's kind of what I'm talking about I was able to trade yes my she had the the quality unit and I had the quantity but five mechs versus one, at some point something's gonna hit, right? Um, and even if I had traded one mech for one mech and it took five of mine to, mine to do it, if the mech I lost was under 40 points and the mech I just took out was 70 or 80, that's a huge trade, right? Um, so I had the material to be able to trade, I had enough guns to try and shoot stuff, I had uh, the speed to push objectives um, and the uh, overall team M to try and weather the storm on an objective so I could play the odds, percentages, and you know, you know, 30% of the time it's not gonna work, 70% of the time it does, and, that, and with my list that's the way it was. And then the technology with players being like, is that Fire Moth gonna get behind me and drop battle armor? Is that Pack Hunter gonna go to get over here and do annoying stuff? So you start bringing all those elements together to build a cohesive list and then trying to play them on the table and figure out how you want to manipulate it as you go. And I basically just said, play a game. Get your models to play a game, that's what I said, right? Um, but when you start from the list building perspective, trying to consider what you want to do, hey, this right here, this is my alpha strike. These right here, I can save points in, in right here by using these skills to get these cheaper units on the table, which saves me points for these damage dealers. And now all of a sudden you're getting into the, to the groove of like, okay, here's my quality units, here's my quantity units, here's my alpha strike unit, here's my units that push objectives, here's my list to try and win games. Um, and in closing, one of the things that I would challenge you guys to do, if you're playing at 300, actually even at 250, it's really the, the lower the point totals are, the easier it is for Inner Sphere uh, to build a higher model count list relative to clanners, in my experience. Uh, it gets harder at like 200 points, but like 250, you could probably still fill 12 models as an Inner Sphere player. It's very difficult for clanners. Um, so the quality versus quantity and attrition thing is very heavily in Inner Sphere's favor uh, at lower point totals. At um, higher point totals, it probably still could be in your favor, but if you have a cap, on unit numbers, which I think Bobby's event's like 16 units, I think. Um, if you have a cap and a high point total, that benefit for um, attrition starts to get less and less because the clanners can start to get more models on the table. So that's a, a thing to, to think about. Um, but I challenge you when you're building your lists, if you're playing Inner Sphere, start aiming for 12 models right out the gate. Try and build a company. If you're a clanner, I highly recommend you aim for 10. Um, at least two stars and then two battle armor. Try and hit that 12 mark. It's gonna be more difficult to get 15 models, to get five battle armor and 10 mechs, but aim for 10 mechs, two battle armor. And um, you're probably gonna find that the two battle armor are gonna be riding on light mechs, a fire moth, um, or something along those lines that can move fast and get up in someone's face, a speedy mech. You don't want it to be on a, a speed 10 mech. If you put your battle armor in the backfield on a, a mad cat, and it's Timberwolf for all of you guys out there who are like, this guy used the wrong term. Um, if you put battle armor on your backline units, and, and I don't mean backline in like weak, because for clanners to speak, backline might 
might be like, oh no, we're old and we can't fight. That's, that's not what I mean. Um, your backline units being the ones that move slower and have more guns. Um, and when I say front line, in this case, I'm, I'm thinking more projection, not actually like tanky. I'm thinking like your fire mouth. So your forward units that move quickly are your fast units versus your slower units that deal more damage-ish. Um, um, if you put a battle armor on a, a, um, a mad cat, right? it's unlikely to make it, its points back because the Mad Cat moves so much slower. So it's a blade of wounds, sure. When you shoot at it, you might hit the battle armor. But every turn the battle armor's not shooting, it's not making its points back. It's not trading material in your favor. So when you're building your 10 mech list for clanners, including two battle armors, so 12 models, you're probably going to find that those two battle armor are most likely going to be riding on a Fire Moth and some other commensurate fast light unit or jumpy unit because you're going to be able to go uh, harass your opponent, push flanks, jump on objectives, or run behind them and drop battle armor. And because that threat is there, you get the trickology, your opponent has to think about where they're going to go, and they always constantly, forever and always have to know that Fire Moth's got a 24 freaking move. How do I get away from it? They're going to be thinking that. And while they're doing that, you're trying to push objectives. So you get a little bit of quality, you get a little bit of quantity, you get a little bit of alpha strike capability with those fast units that can drop your, um, your battle armor, and then your other units get to move forward while your opponent's tied up trying to deal with the material moving. And if they ignore the material that's pushing objectives, it's in your favor. Let them shoot their guns at your Mad Cats uh, and your big units while your Fire Moth gets behind them. They'll regret it. Like, it's, it's a problem. The Fire Moth getting behind you and shooting you in the rear and dropping battle armor is an absolute nightmare. They have to take it out. Uh, it is also the most mobile of mobile pawns because it can go throw itself an objective. Being able to sprint as far as it can on a 4x4 table is absolutely insanity. So <laughs> if you're fighting clanners, that's something to consider taking out early if you can. Don't let the fire moth be your dagger in the back and make sure you bring artillery if you're really worried about fire moths because they die pretty easy to it. If you are an inner sphere player, as I had mentioned before, I think bringing 12 models for the quantity versus quality equation is really good. Same type of philosophy um, holds true. Um, making sure you have your backline units that are tanky and can deal damage, making sure you got um, speedy units to push and hold objectives, you got enough material to trade, fast units to get up in your opponent's face or to push flanks, get behind them. I really favor the Locust for that um, in terms of getting behind players, uh, in terms of uh, really throwaway cheap units with high TMM relative to their point cost to throw on objectives. Check out Wasps and Stingers and um, Valkyries. You put them at like a, a rough pilot skill, let's say five or six, and I know that starts getting real meta, but when you're prepping for a tournament, that happens. Um, you jump, you throw them on objective, their, their gunnery skills treated as too higher than normal for the turn because of the jump and all of a sudden they can't hit anything, but your opponent needs to kill this 15 point model because it's holding an objective. If they choose not to shoot it, they're shooting at something else and that uh, model is going to you know, potentially score you a point from holding an objective. And then if they do kill it and deny you the objective, that's shots that went into a 15 point model and study your bigger models and your bigger models have, um, are better for it in terms of having more life to pro you know, progress in the game. So an attrition based battle. If you want to have a more tailored Alpha Strike element to your Inner Sphere, the uh, Alpha Strike element for that is generally transports. For clanners, that's going to be some type of Omni-Mech carrying battle armor. They can do it with transports, but it's very common and much easier for them to do it with a fast mech that can carry and deploy a battle armor unit. For Inner Sphere, uh, especially during clan evasion, like Omni is not, not, not a thing that's particularly common, um, battle armor neither as well. Um, so there may be some options for those in the in, in the era, but it's not as common as it is for clanners. So just you know, bear that in mind, because someone in the comments probably click, 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 here's this one niche example where they can do it. I get it, but in general. Um, so for Inner Sphere, one of the things you might consider is some type of hover tank or mag, like a Maxim hover tank um, or some type of other fast deploying vehicle that can carry infantry. And one of the things that is particularly brutal for Inner Sphere to do is take some type of hover tank full to the gills with some type of really cheap infantry that have flamers. It's absolutely insane. Even if they don't deal that much damage, for every point of heat you can put on a mech, they lower their movement by two, and they treat their, t or their uh, pilot skill by one higher for each heat, and for every two points of heat, they lower their TMM by one. It's absolutely brutal. So a hover vehicle full of infantry throwing out some flamer stuff um, onto a mech may not kill them, but you can make them borderline useless for a turn, and what is that gonna net you during the next turn? Is that going to allow you to um, get ahead, you know, um, in terms of getting ahead in your points or getting ahead in material? The other thing those infantry are gonna do, if you uh, think back to uh, previous in our little video here, talking about Carrie Joe's list with the, um, this case, a clanner, uh, clanner transport, bringing the tortoise uh, two battle armor in, and then the guy riding outside and dropping them. That's three units that do damage and harass, also an objective, so you have to clear three units, right? 
So think if you're in a sphere and you bring a hover tank and you throw it onto an objective and you drop, let's say, four, uh, four infantry out. And if you're going to Southern Assault, you can only have two of any one thing. So perhaps you have two infantry that have flamers and two that don't, whatever. That's four infantry and one vehicle on an objective. That's five units your opponent has to clear to get you off an objective. Each one of those is an individual target for a mech. If your opponent doesn't have enough material, they have to make choices. Do I waste shots from my Timberwolf with my six or seven points of damage or whatever on a 15 point infantry stand or eight point infantry stand, infantry stand whatever it is, any time, any, any, any shots going to the infantry are not going into the rest of your force and they're cheap for what they do. So they have to clear them off the objective and for that turn they may tie up one of their, your opponent's bigger mechs to allow you to take it down or cripple them while you get ahead. So, and to recap it, <laughs> clanners have battle armor that can ride fast mechs and it's a really easy deployment system. Inner Sphere have very cheap infantry that ride inside transports and the hover vehicles are probably your best bet because of speed. There's obviously um, transport tanks, they're not as fast. Usually you're getting some damage at them, but they're not very fast. You want to be able to get onto the table threat projection, which we've talked about in previous videos. You want to get there quickly. Um, there's also VTOLs. The downside of VTOLs is being able to see them, and obviously you can fly low, uh, but then you have to change elevations to disembark. The easiest way to get them there, especially for a player who doesn't know all the intricacies of all the rules, hover tanks are pretty simple. Don't have to do anything extra like you would with VTOLs. Now again, Obviously, you can do some of this with the clanners as well with transports, but clan evasion being a very common era, those are probably the two things that you're going to see. Uh, in closing, one other thing I think you might want to consider when you are list building, um, if you want to deviate a little bit from anything that I have mentioned, um, it's to bring combined arms. So uh, with clanners, I have mentioned maybe bringing 10 mechs to battle armor. For inner sphere, maybe bring a 12 mechs or dropping down to 10 mechs and bringing in like a hover tank with some infantry or something like that. Combined arms is great. Vehicles bring damage to the table. They bring um, life to the table that your opponent has to deal with. They can hold objectives. They deal pretty decent damage relative to their cost, and they cannot be ignored. There are some really, really good tanks in the Alpha Strike Master unit list um, for their points, and they're really worth considering. So honestly, if you wanted to go a, a vastly different list building style from what I just mentioned, one thing you might consider is like maybe a Lance of Mechs and a couple of Lances of Vehicles, VTOL, Hover Tank, Fully Infantry, and just throw all kinds of cool stuff at your opponent. And they have so many choices to deal with, and there's no one easy way to, to combat those. And the Clanner's got some really nice tanks and stuff too. Um, if that stuff um, is particularly daunting for you to look at, divert back to the mechs and the battle armor, um, and then for intersphere the mechs and maybe one like transport with vehicles, things like that, divert to that, give those a try and see if you like. So in closing, we talked about tricknology, uh, putting units on the table and trying to manipulate your opponent into doing something you want, or at least seeing how they respond, which allows you to change up your gameplay based on how they respond to your unit and what it is trying to do. Uh, consider attrition options. Do you have enough material to play, um, play the game? Can you hold objectives? Can you trade them until you're the opponent and get ahead? Castling, when to do it, why you would want to do it, and how your list functions. Um, if you're playing a super elite, elite list, you're kind of forced to start castling because if you put a guy out on its own, they're easy to single out. So remember that when you're watching your opponents play. And then alpha striking, probably the most important thing from this list next to um, attrition-based stuff. Make sure you have enough material. Build into your list an attrition-based list with enough material to play. Build into it a couple of uh, options for delivering a, a very um, debilitating blow early on, if possible, to get you ahead. Uh, and typically with redundancy, which you're probably going to see like two clan or mechs with battle armor as the forward like alpha striking unit. Carry Joe's list, two transports with battle armor, alpha striking um, type of, of philosophy, redundancy. If you lose one, you still got the other and you're able to, to push forward and try once or twice to trade material, get ahead, see if you can win some games. That said, folks, not sure if this ramble was helpful. I've been driving back and forth to work for the last week and a half thinking about these concepts, and I want to sit down today after work and just ramble about them and see if I can put something out there for you. Maybe it'll be helpful. Maybe it won't. I'm not sure if it was super cohesive or, or coherent, uh, but I wanted to sit here and talk anyway. So hopefully you enjoyed. If you have any thoughts of your own, any things to consider um, or any thoughts from what I have said, sound off in the comments below. If you were listening to this and you don't give two craps about what I said, but you enjoyed listening to me ramble while you get your hobby on, play games, or while you're doing something else, sign up below. Let me know. I'm trying to do this content for you guys because I enjoy it and I want to see the community and the game as a whole grow. That said, as always, if I don't sign off now, you guys know I'll find something to ramble about. So keep painting your models, keep rolling your dice, build some awesome lists and get out there and play, and I'll catch you guys next time. If you made it this far, you're probably a viewer that already hits that like button when you see a video come up. You're probably already a subscriber, and you probably jump into the comments down below to help support the channel, to help support that algorithm. But if you're looking for some other ways to help support the channel too, make sure you check the description down below. Maybe you want to pick up some paints from Monument Hobbies. That's my paint of choice, the Pro Acrylic line is 
Chef's Kiss, good stuff. Maybe you want to check out some of the offerings from Death Through Designs where I work in my day job. We got plenty of 3D printed uh, products as well as MDF terrain, some of the stuff that I have designed myself and we play with here on the channel. And if you're looking to bolster your Battletech uh, ranks, miniatures, and offerings, make sure you check out uh, Bobby from Fortress Miniatures and Games. He's one of the main supporters of the channel as well and supporting any of these companies helps support what I do and helps to ensure that I can continue to bring content to all of you. If you want to become a, a super supporter, I highly recommend you guys check out the Patreon. You guys get the extra little edge to help push more content out, and I really do appreciate that. And my ultimate goal on the channel is to continue to be able to not, not only put out the content we have now, but to get to a point where you can put out more content later, whether that be battle reports or painting tutorials or just more rambles, anything at all. I'd like to be doing more content for you. This is something that I enjoy. I like being able to cast a light into the darkness to bring a little bit of hobby positivity to all of you and make you feel good and also enjoy playing games myself. As we do the final sign off here though, I do want to go ahead and switch on over and do the, the scroll of awesome to showcase all the Patreon supporters and super supporters of the channel to give them some recognition for helping support what I do. Thank you guys so much and I'll catch you guys next time.